The following program is brought to you by the Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg and the Catholic Communication Campaign. Visit us on the web at hbgdiocese.org. Franciscan Media and this local station present American Catholic Radio, Disciples Called to Witness. Production of American Catholic Radio is made possible by listeners like you. And now, here's our host. Welcome to American Catholic Radio Presents Disciples Called to Witness, a program designed to help you know your faith so you can grow in your faith, and then go out and share it. I'm your host, Judy Zarek. When my oldest son was in high school, he volunteered one day a week at a low-income after-school program. When my son's school let out, he would drive over to the center and spend about an hour or two just hanging out with some of the young kids. He would read books to them, color with them, or maybe play outside with the older ones in the fenced-in blacktop area. I never heard him complain once about going there. Even when he was swamped with homework or had to miss some kind of sports practice or event, he always went. He'd come home and tell the rest of the family about his experience when we sat down to dinner. We didn't hear a lot, but getting the small amount we did out of my teenage son said a lot about how much it meant to him. I know that his visits to the center have made an impact on the way he lives out his faith. It's given him a tangible way to put some of what he's learned about his faith into practice. Now, I mention this because today on our show, we're talking about living out our commitment to the Christian life, and that can manifest itself in many ways, one of them being service. Finding service opportunities is a great way to demonstrate our commitment to the faith and become witnesses to others in what we're doing and how we're doing it. You're going to hear from some people today putting that into action. In my Sharing Faith interview, we'll hear from Jim Boyles, a man who's using his God-given gifts and talents to reach out to people thousands of miles away. Then Bishop David Malloy will talk with Sharon Cross about the new evangelization and the call to live out our Christian faith in our everyday lives. In our Discovering Faith segment, John Feaster will talk with Mary Claire Ryan, the president of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, an organization giving people many opportunities to serve and help the marginalized. We've got a terrific show lined up for you, so let's get started and see if you can guess this week's Saint of the Week. Who am I? My final days were filled with hardship and frustration, and my last hours were downright gruesome. But I died a happy man. That's because I was doing what I had always wanted to do, serve in the foreign missions. I think I knew that from my earliest days. I grew up in France and worked on my father's farm. But I had a good mind, and a local priest saw my potential. Thanks to his financial help, I was able to attend a school for boys who had been identified as vocation material. The priest certainly had me pegged right. I was ordained in 1827 and was assigned to a parish. I had had my heart set on preaching the gospel in some far-off land, but I made the most of my situation. In fact, within a few years I had brought new life to the parish and I developed a special devotion to its sick members. Several years after my ordination, I joined the Marists, a missionary congregation just being formed. I was assigned to teach at the junior seminary. It was hardly what I had in mind, but I gave it my all for five years. Then came the thrilling news. The Marists were given responsibility for the area of Western Oceania, and I was assigned to preach the gospel in the islands of the South Pacific Ocean. A group of us, eight altogether, set sail in late 1836. Just about a year later, we landed on the isolated island of Futuna, between Fiji and western Samoa. My superior asked if I would like to begin my missionary life there for six months or so, along with a young Marist brother and an interpreter. I responded with an enthusiastic yes. The six months lasted five years. Our work seemed to go well, I struggled with the new language, but eventually mastered it. I did my best to learn and appreciate the local customs. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but despite my lifelong yearning to be a missionary, I didn't find it an easy life. Still, I felt I was where God wanted me to be. 
I wish I could say the same about many of the locals, especially their king who had a built-in suspicion of foreigners. He saw us as a threat to his power and resisted any attempts we made to convert the people. Actually, we were having some success in that area, but when the king's son requested baptism, everything changed. He ordered us killed. I was clubbed to death, but I had planted the seeds of the faith on fertile ground. Within two years of my death, the whole island became Catholic. I was canonized about a century later. I am the first martyr of Oceania and its patron. Who am I? I am St. Peter Chanel. You are listening to American Catholic Radio Presents Disciples Called to Witness. Our Catholic faith must be reflected in our everyday lives if we hope to evangelize others. In our Sharing Faith segment up next, I'll introduce you to someone who is willing to communicate and witness that faith. 83-year-old Jim Boyles is semi-retired from the company he founded called Artisan Field. It's a family-owned visual communications and marketing firm in Houston, Texas, that his kids still successfully operate. Jim's time is now spent primarily on a venture he began a few years ago for a special friend. About five years ago or six years ago, a very close friend of mine, Father Vincent Thompson, who is a Brazilian priest, who is oh, at the time was a missionary to Colombia, asked our family to produce a product that could be sold, that could raise money for Catholic missions, uh, especially the ones that he was working with in Colombia. And if you could um, create a product, since you are in advertising and marketing, maybe you could help us. If you're not familiar with St. Basil, he's the patron saint of the Congregation of St. Basil, and their members are known as the Basilian Fathers. Jim and his family took on Father Vincent's challenge and decided selling coffee would be their best bet. The reason we selected coffee is that next to oil is the most traded commodity. Almost everyone likes coffee, or they know someone who likes coffee. We also use fair trade coffee, which some people are familiar with. The fair trade coffee is purchased from small independent farmers mm -hmm. who would lose their farms if they didn't get a better price. So we pay a little higher price for our coffee beans so that they can stay in business and help their families. Jim, his wife, and five adult children called their new nonprofit organization St. Basil Coffee. Jim's the only full-time volunteer employee with his kids helping out when they can. We sell coffee online at stbasilcoffee.com. You can call in, that is, at 713-880-9090. And place an order on the phone if you don't have a computer. We do have several churches that sell coffee. They have volunteers, and they create a, a coffee ministry in the church, and they sell coffee once a month. And we will work with other organizations who are trying to raise money for their own events or for their own missions, and we will split profits with them. So, so it's open to, to anyone. We just want to help impoverished people and and we do the best we can to do that. So far this year, they've raised nearly $36,000. And since the organization first began, they've raised approximately $400,000. Their profits were sent not only to the Bazillion missions in Colombia, helping do such things as build schools, run soup kitchens, or build training facilities, but they also sent aid to specific projects in Africa, Mexico, and Haiti. This is not just about coffee. This is about helping people. So if you if you just want coffee and you really don't care to help the missions on, you know, go to the store and buy whatever you want to buy. That's okay. But if you really want to help our missions, help the impoverished people of the world, and there are many, many millions that need help, that that extra five dollars, you know, is going to help someone. So if you, if you want to do that, if you want to help someone, this is an easy way to do it. Just by drinking a cup of coffee, you're going to help someone. You're going to help. You're going to help change a life. Let's put it that way. We send every dollar that we possibly can. We once we can sell enough to have at least ten thousand dollars worth of profit, we send that immediately. So we we try to 
distribute the money as quickly as we can. Although knowing that your monetary gift is being used to help others in need is enough reward for donating, Jim assures us that you can also be certain that you're receiving quality coffee in return. Our coffee sells for $14 a pound, but approximately $5 of that goes to our missions. And it's freshly roasted, so we don't package any coffee until an order comes in. And that's when we package it. So you have freshly roasted coffee with peak aroma. Now, you just can't beat that. You can't buy that in a store. And we have a wonderful uh, uh, coffee. It's called Southern Pecan. That is so good. It is so good and so fresh in the aroma. And I just um, dropped by the roasting company this morning and picked up three bags of it for the office. <laughs> And it's just great coffee. It really is. All their coffee is Colombian. And besides regular coffee, they have both fine and regular grind and decaf, southern pecan, and midnight dark roast. You can find Jim's coffee at stbasilcoffee.com. Personally, I'm not a coffee drinker, but after listening to Jim's story, I plan on ordering some for gifts for the people I do know who drink it. It's such an easy way to make a difference in someone's life. For Sharing Faith, I'm Judy Zarek. Our United States Conference of Catholic Bishops is helping to guide us in the call to witness our faith to others. They invite us all into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and His Church. This week, Bishop David Malloy from the Diocese of Rockford, Illinois, joins producer Sharon Cross. They talked about how we are all called to live out our Christian faith in our everyday lives. Our guest today is Bishop David Malloy of the Diocese of Rockford, Illinois. Welcome, Bishop Malloy. Well, happy to be here with you. Thank you. Bishop, how do you define the Christian life? What does that mean? The first is the deepening of our personal faith. Uh, that's a lifelong task, and particularly in a, a time and a place and a culture where there are so many distractions, it's a really valid call to us to remind us to deepen that faith. Uh, the second thing is something that flows from a deeper faith, which is to have confidence in the faith. I think a lot of people find their faith to be challenged because they don't feel they have the confidence to articulate it. They may know sort of the first line of the paragraph of the church teaches this, or as Catholics we hold this, but when challenged to uh, explain it and to explain how it relates to Christ and explain how it relates to the gospel, they don't have the tools for that. And so uh, the new evangelization helps us to have those tools so that we can have the confidence to explain our faith. And the third point is simply go out and share it. Um, meet with people, talk with people, uh, people in your office, people in the grocery store, people in school. Shouldn't they know that you're a Catholic and a friend of Jesus and proud to be so? Is, it, is that what makes living the Christian life different from just living an ordinary American life? Is that ability, that, that willingness to witness, that uh, willingness to kind of let people know that you are a Christian? I think that is the consequence uh, of living the Christian life. The first thing is, in fact, the living of the, the Christian life and, and getting back to the first point of deepening your faith. So where will that take us? Uh, in the first place, I suppose, it'll take us to Mass. It'll take us to Mass each and every Sunday and Holy Day. And, you know, with a growing love for the Mass and the Eucharist and that deepening of faith and understanding that we meet Christ in such a special way there, uh, Heaven forbid that it might mean we, we, we go to Mass even during the week, and, and that we, particularly those who have children, for example, will stress this, will make this to be one of the primary elements of formation of your children, involving the sacrament of confession, which we know has been such a challenge since the Second Vatican Council. To see this not as some um, distasteful checklist that we have to call ourselves on periodically, but the purification of our friendship with Christ. And again, uh, doing this as an element of strengthening our families, that, that families together would go to confession, not in that sense of confessing at the moment, but that we all go to church and each one go and make our confession and recognize this is a part of identifying who and what we are, our moral values lived day in and day out. And that gets us back to uh, that second point of confidence, being able to understand those moral values, articulate them, and see the connections with the rest of the day, with the rest of the world, of why the contrary to our moral values, in fact, 
aren't just stepping over the the line in the wrong way, but they're um, they're bad for the world. What is to, good for the world is to follow Christ and to live His law. What about some of the other opportunities that people have to witness, like maybe going on a service trip or helping to rehab houses, you know, like Habitat for Humanity? Or how does that help to witness to other people? Well, clearly, um, in one fashion or another, we're all called to be the hands of Christ. We're not called just to have um, our faith in uh, sort of stuck in our head as an intellectual element, but it is to have all kinds of consequences, um, even outside of things like the sacramental life. I think we all need to be aware of, of sort of the daily and hourly possibilities for us to um, reach out with those elements of service. Um, you know, how many of us, for example, have, let's say, uh, someone who has uh, a sick child or a child with special needs or something and recognizing uh, the amount of time, the amount of difficulty, that we could get involved by by helping to overcome that kind of loneliness, to overcome that kind of need. Uh, one of our neighbors or even one of our relatives goes into the hospital. Do we make the time and the effort to make that visit or recognizing what you know, this, the stress this puts on um, the house because they're not there to, to help with the family that's still at home. There are so many daily and hourly sorts of things. Almost everyone in our neighborhood or in our town has a Catholic charities or a soup kitchen or, or one of those kinds of things that could even combine our Catholic faith and this kind of outreach. So the opportunities are surely there. And if we're going to live our faith more fully, that certainly would be uh, the opportunity and the requirement for us. It goes back to that famous uh, citation from the letter of James, I will show you my faith and my works. And, uh, you know, this is this is clearly to live the life that Christ lived, which is what we're called to do. Uh, Christ didn't have one or the other. He had both. Thanks for joining us today, Bishop Malloy. For Call to Discipleship, I'm Sharon Cross. Studies show that people who pray regularly and practice their faith are healthier and happier. I'm Bishop Ronald Gaynor. I want to invite you to experience a positive difference in your life by visiting your Catholic parish and encountering Jesus through the sacraments. Do it for your family, do it for yourself, and come home. Remember that God's mercy is and always will be there for you, no matter what your situation. Visit catholicscomehome.org to find a parish near you. Everyone said it was okay. I had a life. They said it was a choice. I was looking outside for answers. I didn't want to mess it all up. It wasn't the real me that went that day. The life I had, it's gone. Something inside dies after an abortion. If you're suffering because of an abortion, you may feel alone, but you're not. There are people who understand and can help. Call 888-456-HOPE. 888-456-HOPE. A message from Project Rachel. This program is made possible locally by donations to the Catholic Communication Campaign and the Diocese of Harrisburg. This is American Catholic Radio. Here's today's Catholic treasure. What is the international Catholic lay organization that assists the poor? The answer is the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. While meeting with other Catholic students in France in the spring of 1833, Law student Frederick Ozenam considered the challenge of putting Christ's message of love into action. That challenge led Frederick to found the Conference of Charity to assist the poor. The name was soon changed to the Society of St. Vincent de Paul to honor that saint who was known for helping those in need. By 1845, an American branch of the Society was established in St. Louis, Missouri. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul is a Catholic lay organization. Its goal is to help women and men grow in the spiritual life through one-on-one service to the poor and suffering. Anyone can join the Vincentians, as they are also known. Members are found all over the world, joined in an international society of charity. They seek a spirit of poverty, humility, and sharing, fed by regular prayer and reflection. They meet regularly for mutual support and follow a basic rule of life. Many American parishes have a local branch of the Vincentians. Typically, the parish staff will refer specific needs to its local society members, who in turn offer food, financial assistance, referrals, or simple presence, always striving to ensure their clients' dignity and confidentiality. In turn, 
parishioners provide their local groups with financial resources to do their work. Some 12 million persons are helped annually through the good works of this Catholic treasure, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. You're listening to American Catholic Radio presents Disciples Called to Witness. Today on Discovering Faith, producer John Feaster talks with Mary Claire Ryan, president of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps in Baltimore, Maryland. The Jesuit Volunteer Corps offers women and men an opportunity to work full-time for justice and peace. Their mission is one of serving the poor directly, working for structural change in the United States, and accompanying people in developing countries. John spoke with Mary Claire about living out our Christian faith with an attitude of service, love, and compassion. Thanks for being with us today, Mary Claire. Ryan, I know that you're the uh, president of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. I wonder if, if you could just give us a very quick look at what is Jesuit Volunteer Corps? Well, um, the Jesuit Volunteer Corps um, has been around for quite some time. And uh, this year we've got over 300 volunteers serving in uh, 39 cities across the U.S. and in six countries wow. around the world. Jesuit volunteers you know, work in all kinds of social service agencies full-time for a year, sometimes two, international aid as a two-year commitment. But Jesuit volunteers serve as teachers, paralegals, advocates for the poor in all kinds of organizations, social workers. They work in soup kitchens, legal clinics, refugee resettlement offices, community centers. And JVC, as an organization, we work as hard as we can as a national organization to support the volunteers in their service. Yeah. Now, these aren't high school students, that's for sure, from what you've said. How, how old are the volunteers? How, how does that go? For the most part, these these are um, recent college graduates. Uh-huh. So they, they go to this. And that's the value, you know, in so many ways, you know, um, their value to the agencies and to our partnering agencies. You know, these are recent college graduates who come with skills and a deep desire to address um, the issues of injustice. Yeah, the the social need and the way to to make things right. Huh? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just that fundamental desire to make the world better. You know, sometimes we hear, you know, you hear this from volunteers. I guess you know, that we receive more than what we give. Do you think that's true with the Jesuit volunteers? I do. I, I, I do, and, and, you know, I go back to what I said to you just earlier about the, the former Jesuit volunteers that I have met, have known, and I continue to meet very frequently, um, almost day to day, that uh, the, the meaning uh, of this experience, though it is an experience when they were newly out of college, um, now they're young, middle-aged, family, mothers, fathers, and it's still it's still revealing a profound and significant meaning to them in their lives. So can, give me an example of that, if you could. Huh? How does volunteer experience inspire some sense of Christian discipleship? Yeah. Well, JVC um, promotes four values, uh -huh. if you will. And they are spirituality, simple living, social justice, and community. And I... I you know, I think it's easy for us to imagine, and as I said, I've experienced it, you know, how someone, as they move through life in this culture at this point in time, often does reflect on what place does spirituality have in my life today? Mm -hmm. what, what place does striving for justice have in my life today? And what happens during the JBC year is that Time is dedicated, it's given to the retreat year experience, it's given to reflecting on these values within the tradition of Ignatian spirituality. Now, which, when you say, and briefly, I guess all of the the traditions in the Church shine some different light on what it means to be Christian, huh? So what, what's special about Ignatian or Jesuit spirituality? Oh, gosh. You know, it's very, you know, no, I will say it, it is special. Um, it is rooted in a simple, beautiful, and complex conviction that God is active, personal, 
and most profoundly very present to us in all things, all things, yes. right? And so the Jesuit volunteer year experience um, offers opportunities for um, retreats, gathering in prayer and reflection to to develop in a way, to, to develop good practices around understanding what does that mean to, what does it mean to seek God in all things? Yes. How do I do that? You know, and the Ignatian tradition provides uh, techniques, if you will, yeah. um, really wonderful techniques for setting out to do that. As, you know, the most well-known or famous, I guess you could say, is the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. So I, I guess if I were a Jesuit volunteer, it'd be a time for me to really learn that practice, huh? Yes, exactly. You know, and again, these are, these are techniques, uh, contemplative practices, you know, developed by uh, Ignatius and his sons through the ages, you know, to, to bring people closer to God. For Discovering Faith, I'm John Feaster. This is Judy Zarek here to wrap up this edition of ACR Presents Disciples Called to Witness. Every time Christmas or someone's birthday comes along, I tell myself I'm going to try and get them a gift that really means something, as opposed to the first thing I see at the local hallmark. I'm usually so tight for time that I end up just picking something up at the last minute. This year, I'm going to do my best to not let that happen. Jim Boyles made his St. Basil coffee sound so good, I'm going to order some for my friends to give them at Christmas. And I'll try to order them before December 25th. And for my music lover friends out there, I'll remember that two of my guests this year, Danielle Rose and Jack Cassidy, both have some great inspiring new tunes on their albums. Or maybe I'll order a book for someone in my family from one of the many inspiring authors I've talked to on the program. These are just some really small ways I can share part of my faith with others. If they drink coffee, listen to music, or like to read, then even if they don't pay attention to the good that's being done for others or hear God's special message to them through these things, they'll still be able to enjoy a good cup of coffee, listen to a pretty song, and read a good book. It seems like the least I can do in an effort to live out my commitment to the Christian way of life. I think I'll look through our podcast archives for even more ideas. You can do it too. Just go to our webpage, productions.franciscanmedia.org and click on American Catholic Radio. Now, all I have to do is sit down and get that Christmas list started. You can find ACR archive programs and more on the web at productions.franciscanmedia.org, where you can contact us and also meet our production team, Sharon Cross, John Feaster, Ron Riegler, Chris Holmes, Father Dan Anderson, and our executive producer, Matt Wilgoss. Music for our program was composed and arranged by Bobby Fisher. I'm Judy Zarek. Join me next time for another edition of American Catholic Radio Presents Disciples Called to Witness. This program is made possible locally by donations to the Catholic Communication Campaign and the Diocese of Harrisburg.